and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and today I'm really looking forward to having a discussion with you about the Irish mobster who captured the imagination of the nation and that was Jack Legs Diamond. Diamond has so many rumors encircling his history that it was dizzying for me to try to lay out a comprehensive history of his life for you today. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to that Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss. So let's get right to it. John Thomas Diamond, some say that this wasn't his real name, but it does seem accurate according to most sources, was born on July 10, 1897 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was the son of poor Irish immigrants. In 1913, when Diamond was 16 years old, his mother Sarah died. Diamond and his little brother Eddie then moved with their father to Brooklyn. Diamond's father neglected his children, leaving them hungry and to their own devices. Diamond wasted no time getting involved in a life of crime. By February 4th, 1914, Diamond was arrested for the first time in a jewelry store robbery. By February 15th, 1914, he was on his way to the Hart Island Reformatory. Hart Island was used as an alternative form of punishment for young men convicted of misdemeanors. The idea was to have a tamer, reform-based punishment that not only taught young men useful trades, but also used work in a strict schedule as a form of punishment rather than sitting in a cell. Listen, you can debate the effectiveness of alternative legal punishment all you want, be my guest, but I can tell you that for Jack Diamond, it did not do the trick. Once Diamond was released, he got right back into a life of crime. He would go on to be arrested 20 times and his earliest offenses were mostly theft-based. Diamond was known for his violent nature, which would go on to make him a tabloid sensation later in his life. He worked closely with Jacob Organ, the kingmaker of several notorious New York mobsters, including Jewish Hood's Louis Bacalter and Jacob Shapiro. Organ was an Arnold Rothstein-funded mobster, just like all of the other mobsters in New York during that era, who seemed to have a knack for finding talent. It was under Organ that Diamond committed his first murder and would go on to be a frequently used hitman for Organ's purposes, and Diamond's brother Eddie would go on to be Organ's bodyguard. Diamond would find favor with Rothstein and soon run his operations with direct funding from him. Through these operations, Diamond was elevated, in the eyes of the public, to the level of even Lucky Luciano, with whom Diamond frequently worked. Aside from murder and robbery, Diamond was also arrested and jailed for desertion during World War I. Shockingly, Diamond was no patriot. He gained a name for himself as a violent, ruthless criminal and likely would have remained in that category had Prohibition not changed the trajectory of his career. By 1919, Prohibition was on the horizon, and due to a combination of funding from Rothstein and Oregon, Coupled with his violent, determined nature, Diamond made a fortune as a bootlegger. He started his own business, providing shipments to speakeasies. He was also notorious for organizing and participating in the robbing of trucks carrying booze for other mob players to fuel the speakeasies to which he supplied and personally owned. While looking into his history as a bootlegger, I found some fascinating stories about his life. Diamond got control of the Barman Brewery and distributed their beer to the speakeasies he operated. The story gets more interesting as, according to legend, Diamond, knowing by experience the pitfalls of transportation via railways and trucks, paid off Kingston officials to allow him to run what were known as subterranean beer lines to various speakeasies in the area. A subterranean beer line is a fancy way of saying that they were shipped through the sewage system. This creates the image of bootleggers popping out of manholes, carrying crates of beer to nearby speakeasies, then disappearing again beneath the street in the dark of night. While this story makes for an entertaining idea, the reality of the situation is, as always, a little less interesting. The beer was not being sent through the sewers directly to speakeasies via manholes, but rather the beer line was run along the sewers to a warehouse where it was bottled and kegged to then be sent out to speakeasies above ground. Historian Ed Ford joked, I wonder how it tasted. At the beginning of 1923, Organ's crew began feuding with another gang led by Nathan Kaplan. Kaplan and Organ were both vying for the control of what became known as labor slugging rackets, or providing muscle for the various labor strikes around New York during this time. That would often lead to unionization, and that would put the sluggers in a great position within the union, and that's how you get that union racket started. This would break out into street violence and the arrests of several men from both sides. The conflict came to an end when Kaplan was shot and killed on August 28, 1923, by organ gunman Louis Kersner. It's reported that Diamond was the man who called for the hit. Diamond, who at this point was very much a boss in his own right, but who remained loyal to organ, 
walked a strange path as far as mobsters go. He wasn't the most violent gangster, nor was he the most successful New York bootlegger, yet he completely captured the imagination of the public. Diamond was outgoing and personable. He was noted to have been an excellent dancer. According to author and professor Gary Levine, it was because of Diamond's skills as a dancer that he earned his nickname of Legs. Diamond was also known as a flamboyant womanizer. While he was known to have had many lovers, there were two primary women in his life, his wife, Alice Diamond, and his showgirl mistress, Marion Kiki Roberts. Jack and Alice were married in 1926. Alice was a deeply religious woman who was devoted, as you'll see soon, to the point of ad nauseum to her womanizing criminal husband. She was completely loyal to him and seemed always to be by his side during his various arrests, court dates, and brushes with death. Although Eddie Diamond was Jacob Oregon's bodyguard, his big brother Jack Diamond substituted for him on October 15, 1927. Oregon and Diamond were approached by three young men who opened fire immediately. Oregon was killed. Diamond was shot twice just below the heart. He was taken to the Bellevue Hospital, where he was given last rites, but eventually recovered. His loyal wife Alice remained by his side throughout the recovery. In August of 1930, Diamond had gone to Germany, allegedly for mineral water cures for his lingering injuries. The real reason was to set up a supply line for rye whiskey to be imported into the United States from Germany. While he was there, he was treated like a celebrity and allegedly won thousands of dollars in card games, but eventually the German authorities caught up with him and deported him back to the United States. Back to his personal life, Diamond's mistress Kiki Roberts could not have been any more different from his wife. Rather than religious, she had very much a devil-may-care attitude. Coasting on her looks and sex appeal, Kiki seemed to have no qualms about her relationship with a married man. When the press would ask Alice Diamond about her husband's relationship with Kiki, Alice replied, she is not worth discussing. Now, don't go on about your day thinking that he treated his wife like a slave and his mistress like a queen. No, no. He treated both of them terribly. While Diamond took advantage of what seemed like Alice's genuine love and concern for him, cheating on her openly, giving not a care for her time, and calling for her when he was in trouble, as we'll see soon. He took advantage of Kiki as well, using her merely as a sexual release and a punching bag. In fact, many believe that Kiki, tired of Diamond's abuse, was the one who called for some of the attempts on his life. We'll get to that in just a moment. Diamond's personal life was a nightmare. It was actually while he was with Kiki at the Hotel Monticello in Manhattan that gunmen showed up and filled Diamond with lead on October 12, 1930. This was one of the murder attempts many believe Kiki had requested. Diamond survived the attempt on his life, spending weeks in the hospital. After he returned home, Alice nursed him back to health in December. By early April, he let her know that Kiki would be moving in with them. The Daily News reported on this arrangement, calling it the happy little threesome. This, even for the devoted Alice Diamond, was too much to handle. In response to this affront to their marriage, Alice moved out. Good for her. This would mark the only time she stood up for herself. Diamond continued in his work as a bootlegger and murderer, keeping Kiki close by. She was with him the night that he and his men had forced Grover Parks, a driver, off the road, tied him to a tree, and set him on fire in Cairo, New York in 1930. Parks was no doubt involved in the transportation and delivery of illegal booze in some capacity. Diamond and his men suspected that he was working for a rival gangster, but Parks never gave up the name. Parks miraculously survived this attack and pointed a finger to Diamond as his attacker. This prompted law enforcement, even federal law enforcement, to come down hard on Diamond, and it also provoked the local community and friends of Parks. 1931 was easily the worst year of Diamond's life. It also happened to be the last year of his life. On April 21st, 1931, Diamond was arrested and jailed for two days for the assault and attempted murder of Grover Parks. He was released on a $25,000 bond. Within a week of his release on April 27th, 1931, Diamond was gunned down by shotgun fire by unknown assailants. This was another murder attempt that some think Kiki Roberts was responsible for. The story goes that some of Diamond's own men, to whom Kiki had been complaining about Diamond's treatment, shot him down in retaliation for the treatment of the lover they were no doubt sharing. It's worthy of note that Kiki Roberts ran off after this attempted murder. However, most assume that these were locals furious over the attempted murder of Grover Parks. This entire saga would mark the end of Diamond's carefree life as a criminal. The rest of his life and career would be marked by arrests, court dates, accusations, and violence. When Alice Diamond got to the hospital to once again be beside her wounded husband, 
who had been gunned down while in the care of another woman again. Her primary concerns were his well-being, of course, and whether or not he had called for anyone else. She asked the police officer when she arrived, he didn't ask for any other woman? The officer's response that he had not reportedly filled her with joy. This poor woman put up with so much. After he had finally recovered from his previous injuries and deportation woes, Diamond was met with a barrage of legal battles. In June of 1931, Alice was called to testify before a grand jury regarding her husband's operations in Catskills, New York. She refused to testify. Then in July, Diamond was tried but acquitted for the assault of Grover Parks. Then in August, he was finally sentenced to four years in prison for federal liquor charges. Alice was devastated by the guilty verdict. Diamond never served his time behind bars, though, as the appeals process would take up the remainder of his life. That's not the end of his personal drama, though. In October of 1931, Kiki Roberts returned to the scene, working on Broadway. By November, Kiki and Diamond had resumed their affair. Unsurprisingly, Alice remained loyal. When Diamond was retried for the assault of Grover Parks, he was acquitted on December 17, 1931. Upon hearing the sound of the gavel acquitting Diamond, it is reported that Alice leapt from her chair and showered her husband with hugs and kisses. Following the acquittal, Diamond, Alice, and a group of friends went out to Albany, New York for drinks to celebrate. As the night went into the next morning, Diamond left the group at 1 a.m. to go visit Kiki. He promised Alice he would be back within an hour. This was the last time that Alice would ever see her husband alive, and he was leaving to go visit his mistress. Diamond did not return to his wife. Instead, he remained with Kiki until 4.30 in the morning. After that point, he returned to his own hotel room that he had rented for the night and fell asleep. An hour later, two gunmen entered the room. One held him down while the other fired three bullets into the back of his head. While this was going on, Alice sat at the bar, patiently waiting for his return. The murder of Legs Diamond remains unsolved, although many strongly suspect that Dutch Schultz was responsible for ordering the murder of his rival. But there are many others suspected of this crime. Unfortunately, Diamond made so many enemies, all of whom had means and motives to take him out, that in the absence of the type of DNA evidence we have today, we may never know what really happened. John Thomas Diamond was murdered on December 18, 1931. He was 34 years old. What makes this story even more interesting is that his wife, Alice Diamond, was shot and killed two years later on June 30, 1933. Many suspect that she had information about her husband's murderers and was preparing to come forward. May, Alice's sister, said the following of their marriage. Alice wasn't the kind to bear a grudge. She recognized that Jack was so constituted that he could never be a faithful husband, and she knew she held in the hollow of her hand the best and finest part of his emotional side. Both Jack and Alice Diamond were buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery in Queens, New York. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews discussing the short but dramatic life of Irish mobster Jack Legs Diamond. Diamond was the type that was bound to die young. He was reckless and made an enemy out of nearly everyone he ever worked with. Make sure to let me know in the comments section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about Legs Diamond. Also, don't forget to utilize the comment section and social media to let me know about who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao!